And there's a whole teaching of Jesus that follows a long, long chapter, actually, where, where he begins, in fact, with the word, my father is working until now, and I'm working here. We have that shocking for them, for apparently for those uh, uh, Bible teachers, rabbis, scribes. My father? How could, how could this man call God his father? So we're going to look at that. We're not going to kind of make a little parenthesis here. What I want to do is I want to show you uh, in the Old Testament, but also in the New, uh, in the Old Testament, how uh, the, the idea of uh, that God has a son. It is not something new or original in the Gospels or with Jesus. It's something that's there uh, actually quite a bit in the Old Testament. The title uh, of Son of God or the Son calling God his Father is a an expression that we find in the Old Testament to describe the Messiah. The Messiah is also called the Son of David. He's also called the Son of Man. He, there are different ways that the Messiah is described. The Messiah is the anointed one, and that's what it means. The savior of Israel, the king of Israel. Uh, more than that, actually, the savior of, of the world, even, even in the Old Testament. The savior of everybody. The one through whom uh, blessings come. And basically, I would say that everything that Jesus says about himself, even when he says, I'm the good shepherd, all of that is already in some fashion is already in the Old Testament. And it's very important to understand that we're not, when we go to the New Testament, we're not dealing with something totally that had nothing to do with the old. It's a continuation. It's actually a fulfillment of what we find already in some shape or fashion in the Old Testament. If we separate the old and the new too much, we're going to have big trouble. We're going to have people saying, well, this is just a pagan, uh, uh, a a sort of pagan belief about Jesus that he rose from the dead or he was born of a virgin. We, we kind of like, we, we, might, we might think this has to do with some kind of mythology and all, but when we look at the Old Testament, we realize it's actually not that. What it is is the, is the realization of all that the Old Testament was already saying. And Jesus himself said that in Luke 24 after his resurrection. That's a very important chapter, Luke chapter 24, where Jesus meets his disciples, some of his disciples, and it says there that he, uh, he explained to them all of the scriptures, that everything written about him uh, in the law and the prophets and the writings, which are the three different parts of the Jewish Bible called today the Tanakh, uh, Tanakh, the three parts uh, of, the, uh, of the Bible for the Jews. Uh, let's look at uh, the Old Testament, a few, a few passages. So we're going to start with um, 2 Samuel. Uh, this is a, in a very important passage. Second Samuel chapter 7 is the covenant, a covenant actually, that God makes with David. Now not, notice we think about, there's a few covenants, of course, the covenant at Sinai, but there's a number of covenants that we don't always talk about. And the covenant uh, made with David is very, very important to understand the idea of the Messiah, of the Savior, and the son of David. So in chapter 7, here's God speaking to David. Remember then that God made a covenant with David, a special covenant with David, the king of Israel. Thank you, Rita. Wow. When Rita makes it, it's 10 times better than when I do. For some, uh, for some reason, the taste is better. It just has a better impact on me. There's something uh, there. I don't know. It's kind of strange. Thank you, Rita. As long as I don't spill it. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Here's what God says to uh, David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, is it working? Yes. I will raise up your offspring after you. Okay? Offspring, that's a descendant huh, of David who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. 
Uh, and of course, when you begin to read Matthew, one of the, sh one of the surprising things about Matthew is that you, be you begin with the genealogy, of course, and you have, you know, son of David, from son of Abraham. And it's actually one of the ways that uh, these days, one of the ways to actually uh, help Jews, uh, Jews understand who is Jesus, because you, you may not know this, but most of the Jews do not know that Jesus was a Jew. Was a Jew. Uh, most of them. They think that Jesus was Catholic. And, and that Jesus, uh, in Hebrew, they say Yeshu. They don't say Yeshua, which is his real name. Yeshua is an insult. He's a Gentile. When they open Matthew, they say, this is a Jewish book. He's a Jew. Surprise. Very important. So here what we have is God speaking to David and saying that one of his descendants is going to be king. That's the Messiah. That's the basic idea of Messiah, the king of Israel. He, well, here's what God says about him. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, the kingdom that this, this descendant of David who's coming, this offspring of David, not only is going to be king of Israel, but his kingdom will be eternal. It's not any kind of descendant of David, okay? Uh, it's not Solomon or anybody else. It's not any of the kings that come from David along the line of Judah. Of course, and of which there were very few that were good, actually. Only a handful in the history of Judah. Only a handful were good. In fact, it ends very well with, it ends very bad with the kingship. The kingship basically is finished. You have to, we have to realize that, that under the days of Jeremiah, uh, the kingship is done. Zedekiah is the last king. He's taken into captivity. He dies there. No more kings. No more kings. For how long? Over 500 years. But there is a promise. Where is the king? We've got to have a king because God promised and God made a covenant with David that one of his descendants would come and rule, but his kingdom would be eternal. It's much bigger than just what David could have as, as a kingdom. That's what we have here. Remember that when Jesus was born, and for centuries, the Jewish people were waiting for who? A king. Because they knew about this. There should, there's a descendant of David that's going to come again and rule him. And it'll be perfect. He will be holy. He will be powerful. He will heal people. He will uh, open the eyes of the blind. He, oh, that reminds me of somebody. People forget that all these miracles Jesus did were pronounced already prophesied in the Old Testament. Oh, that's fascinating. Many, many other things. Many other things. Even Isaiah will say in chapter 9 of Isaiah, the prophet will say, when he comes, he will be a light to the Gentiles in the land of Galilee. Surprising. The land of Galilee? will see a light? And he will perform great things? Wow. Anyway, <laughs> I'm kind of going aside here. So he says he will build a house for my name. I will be to him a father. Notice this. I will, God says, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This king who comes, coming from David, whom who establishes an eternal, everlasting kingdom, uh, who builds a house for God. It's not the temple, something much bigger. It says here, I shall be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So when we hear about Jesus talking about the Son of God, why should we be surprised? Or when he says in John 5, my father, why would she be surprised? That's the covenant with David. Let's look at another passage. Psalm 89. I'm just looking at a few here. Psalm 89. And this whole Psalm 89, uh, a good part of it is what we call messianic, has to do with the coming Messiah. Let's look at verse 19. It's a long Psalm, verse 19. Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, this is God who spoke, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. It's talking about this Messiah, this king that Israel is waiting for. I have found David, my servant, 
with my holy oil I have anointed him, Mashiach. David, is that David, the, the, the actual David who lived back then? No, no. He, the Messiah is called David because he's the son of David and has anointed him. That's Mashiach, the Christ, the Messiah. God has anointed him. So that my hand shall be established with him, my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, the wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. This is the same idea we find in Psalm 2 that we've already talked about, who is also uh, the son of God, uh, called his son. God gives him authority over the nations. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him. In my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me. And here's what he says here about this Messiah, this, this son of David. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Prophetically here saying that when the Messiah comes, he will be saying, you are my father. That's exactly what Jesus says. It was to be expected that when the Messiah would come, he would speak like that. But they, they don't accept it. They, they don't believe that it's him. He doesn't correspond to what they think the Messiah should be. But look at what, all that he does. All these amazing things that he, Jesus did. And his words go along with what we find here. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. The firstborn is not the one who is born the first. Okay? The firstborn in Hebrew language, in Old Testament language, is the one who received the inheritance. That's a title for the one who receives the inheritance. He could be born not the first one and still be considered the firstborn. That's the one who gets the inheritance. That's, the, that's what it means. Okay? The highest of the kings of the earth. So Jesus, the Messiah who is coming, is coming as the king, not just of Israel, but the king of who? According to this verse. Verse, 17, verse 27. Who is he the king of? Huh? Of all the kings of the earth. So when Jesus is born under Caesar, under Caesar, this one was born, this little baby, is a king already. So you have kings from the east that come and worship him. You have a Caesar in Rome who is basically the ruler of the world. But who is the highest ruler? That baby or that Caesar? That baby. He's the, he's the real king. And he's the king of everybody else. And he's the king of everybody else today. Not just back then. That's the idea of his kingdom being everlasting. Now that's not what fundamentally that's what Christians believe. And fundamentally, that's why Christians were being persecuted by Rome. Why? Because Rome, in the Roman law, at the time of the emperors, you did not have the right to call anybody Caesar but Caesar. If you did that, you could be killed. You don't have the right to call anybody Caesar. We have only one Caesar, and as we see that in the book of Acts. Why are you calling him king? He's no king. That's the problem. And says, my steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will him will stand, uh, my covenant will stand firm for him. That brings us back to the, uh, to the book of Samuel with David, the covenant that God makes with the son of David. Let's look at another passage. And these are just a few I'm looking at. Now I'm going to show you a passage that's very interesting because this one is not very well known. And it's Proverbs chapter 30. And you will see something here very fascinating that actually the rabbis have been discussing for centuries and never figured out what is this all about. I have all different kinds of ideas about this. Proverbs chapter 30. Verse 4. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? That's a question. Is there anybody that has ever ascended to heaven and come down? Obviously not. No man has done that. Well, do we know somebody who's ascended to heaven? Yeah, Jesus. We know even somebody who's come down from heaven. Because when Jesus comes, he comes from heaven. He's not just born of Mary. He comes from heaven. That's where he was. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Of course. And who has established all the ends of the earth? Of course, there's only one. That's God. But look at this. What is his name? And what is his son's name? 
You mean the creator has a son? And he is asking here, what is his name? Did you notice that? Well, that's fascinating. This is a very mysterious text for people even today. What does this mean? And they've been writing tons about this. You mean, what is his name? It's God, of course. And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He's, he's asking a question here that nobody has an answer to, but he's making, a he's making a statement that this one who has created everything has a son. Huh. Well, that's, we know that if we read Psalm 2, Psalm 89, uh, all these texts. There's something going on in heaven. There's something going on with God where we can actually talk about God having a son. And let's look at a few, two others in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, here's the, uh, the prophecy of the Messiah. So the Messiah, the, the son coming, and his name shall be Emmanuel. Okay? Emmanuel means God with us. Verse 10. Uh, God is, is talking to King Ahaz. Ask the sign of the Lord. You let, it be the, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary me that you weary my God also? Verse 14, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is quoted, of course, in Matthew. Huh? He will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. How could a virgin conceive a baby? Uh, there's a problem there. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I, that that's kind of strange. Now, the word virgin in Hebrew is, is Alma. And the, the Jews will reason and say, well, that could be a young girl or a virgin. However, 270 years before Christ in Alexandria, 70 scribes, Jewish scribes, got together and translated the Hebrew into Greek. And they translated Alma here with the Greek word that means virgin. So they understood that it's about a virgin. So, so she shall bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Of course, that's quoted in Matthew. Emmanuel means God with us. And the idea of a, of a child that comes and saves Israel is repeated it, actually a number of times in Isaiah. Isaiah is very messianic. Some people have called Isaiah the fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Isaiah, because there's much more in Isaiah than anywhere else about the Messiah. But anyway, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for to us a child is born, a son is given, and look what it says about this son. The government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. When you read that, you expect this tremendous king to come. But look at his name. Look at what he's called. Is anybody else called like that in the Old Testament? Mighty God? Everlasting Father? Prince of Peace? He's pretty unique. And so he's over the throne of David, the corresponds, his kingdom, with justice and righteousness. And again, this idea of an eternal kingdom. This idea of the, of the Messiah establishes an eternal kingdom is very important. It's found throughout the whole Old Testament. Daniel chapter 2, you know, all these Psalms, 100, Psalm 110, 118, uh, Psalm 2. A lot of these texts talk about the kingdom, but as eternal. That's very important, as opposed to human kingdom, you know, that only lasts for a time. Uh, let's look at, uh, what did we look at now? Okay, so uh, I would like to show you now in the New Testament how 
whenever it's many times when it's questioned about the Christ, uh, the Christ, the Messiah, is called many times in the New Testament the Son of God. And that's normal in the Jewish context of the Old Testament. It's not something that the scribes should be shocked. When Jesus talks about my Father, if the Messiah came and talked about God, he would talk about him as his Father. If he didn't, that would be awkward. He's just fulfilling the Old Testament, what it said about him. So let's look at a few passages. Let's start with uh, Matthew 16. Uh, <coughs> so we're looking at the idea of Jesus called, or the Messiah called, Son of God, which is exactly the same as saying Messiah or Christ. It's the same. So let's look at Matthew 16. Here is a very important text here, Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Notice, the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man is also a title of the Messiah. It's saying he's called the Son of God, he's called the Son of Man, because he's both divine, he's both human. Son of Man is found, for example, in the book of Daniel. Daniel sees the Son of Man coming in glory. That's the Messiah. Just to show that this Messiah's coming is a man. And very important to understand because even in the first century, there were people teaching at that time that the Messiah would be an angel, not a human being. That was the Gnostics. They thought he cannot be a human being because flesh is bad. Gnosticism. It's got to be an angel. The, the Messiah cannot be a human being. So he's called son of man. He's called son of David. He's born somewhere. Huh? Micah chapter 5. He's born of David. He's born of a virgin. So he's not an angel. <laughs> That's very important, okay? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Here's what people were saying at the time about Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Notice. He say, well, he must be John the Baptist or Elijah, whatever. And he said to them, but who do, you, who do you say that I am? Notice something. It's very important to realize that when we see I am, somewhere there we have God already. And Jesus used that a lot, especially in John. When he says I am, you can hear the name of God in Hebrew, even in Aramaic language. You can hear the name of God, which is I am. So it's repeated. It's constantly there. I am, okay? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ. Let's say you are the Messiah, uh, to understand what he's talking about. With this Messiah that we talked about in 2 Samuel 7, uh, Psalm 89, Isaiah 7, Isaiah chapter 9, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So notice how Peter responds. As a normal Jew would, he says, you're the, the Messiah, which is the Son of the living God. It's the same thing. That's how he's described. He's described as son of David, as son of man. He's also described as son of the living God. What did Jesus answer? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Notice how Jesus responds immediately by saying my Father. Confirming this confession of Peter, my Father. This is my Father. So he's got this very personal connection with God, but also by saying that, he's affirming his messiahship, that he's the Messiah. And that's going to be a big, big problem for the Jewish uh, scribes that we see in John chapter 5, for the Pharisees, but everybody. It's going, to be, it's going to be problematic for them, even though it's in the Old Testament quite a bit. It's to be expected that he would call his, God his father. But it's hard for it's just hard on them. And so, um, so my father who is in heaven. So he says, I tell you, uh, you, uh, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're not going to explaining the rock. Of course, we have, it's interesting in the Greek, we have two different words here. Huh? You have Peter, Petros, and on this rock, Petra. We have one masculine word, one a feminine word, which also indicates we're talking not, about, not talking about Peter. In French, translation we have a problem because he says tu es pierre et sur cette pierre because the word stone in French is the same word as Peter. We have a real problem there because then what well, he's talking about Peter. Of course you read it in Latin it's different 
the two words. You read it in Greek, these are two words, also different. So I don't want to go into that, but, but in any way, in any case, who is the rock in the Bible, in the Old Testament? It's always God or the Messiah, nobody else. There's nobody else that described as the rock of Israel, the rock, the stone, the rock, as God himself in many, many places, or the Messiah himself called the rock or the stone on which God builds his house. So let's look at another, uh, of course, he talks about the kingdom too, and that's connected, of course. The kingdom as the kingdom of David, huh? as the kingdom of the Messiah, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. All of these are the same thing. When Jesus begins his ministry, what does he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You could say kingdom of heaven is the same thing. Kingdom of David is the same thing. Kingdom of Israel is the same thing. Just different uh, synonyms to talk about the same reality. All right, let's look at another passage. Now it's back in John uh, chapter 20. John gospel is trying to establish that Jesus is the Messiah. And he does that through two ways, the signs and the teachings. The signs, seven of them, and the teachings. And that's what we're dealing with right now. We're talking about John, but this is like a little study we're doing just to show something else that to explain why John's emphasis here look at the end of John chapter 20 Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples John reports only seven only seven if you read Matthew chapter 4 right before the Sermon on the Mount at the end of chapter 4 it says that they came from all over Israel all over Judea all the way from Syria Great multitudes, and he healed them all. So it's not just one healing, huh? or one blind man that got healed. But John selects seven because of their significance. That's why he calls them signs. Huh? The sign is a miracle, but it's not the sign in itself. What does it mean, the sign, that he changed water? And it's, what does it mean? What? That's the point, okay? That's what we have here. So, um, but these are written, these signs, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I always translate Christ by Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. This is a very important verse. Very, very important. When my, one of my sons was in the, in the school uh, studying under the priest, private school, and in the catechism class, uh, they were studying the catechism. You know, Catholic catechism with all the things you need to believe. And so my son talked to the, uh, to the priest and said, well, I don't find all of this in the Bible. And if he said, well, you still need to believe in it. You cannot be saved if you don't believe in all the creeds of the Catholic Church. So my son came home and told me that. I said, quote this verse to the priest. John 20, verse 20 and 21, and ask him if there's anything else we need to know to believe and be saved. Look what it says. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What we have in John is enough. We have more. What we have in John is enough to be a Christian. You have everything you need. It's enough. One emphasizes this idea of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God, what that means, and, and of course equality with God. First John chapter two, and here we're going to talk about a passage that's interesting. Uh, let's read chapter 2, verse 22. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. So if you deny that Jesus is the Messiah, you're, you're, you have a problem, okay? And then he says, this is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and Son. Now you hear, you'll hear a lot about Antichrist these days. You know, people say, oh, this is the Antichrist is going to be this one. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. The only Antichrist that we have, it's mentioned very few times. It's only mentioned in John. It's not mentioned in, God, in the Revelation, as you might think. The only mention, the only thing about Antichrist is the Antichrist is a false teacher, false teaching. It's the one who comes and says that Jesus is not the Christ. That's all. So it's nonsense to say that Stalin was Antichrist, you know, this guy was Antichrist, you know, Hitler was Antichrist. It's nonsense. There's nothing like that. Just wanted you to know 
that all of that is just not in Scripture. But the Antichrist, that's the one. Antichrist means who is against Christ huh, in the Greek language, who is against the Messiah, of course. He denies that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Notice, the Father and the Son. These are important concepts. The Father and the Son. No one, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you, which is from the beginning, from the, those who preached the gospel in the first, the apostles in the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will, be abide, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Well, so if somebody comes along and says, yeah, Jesus was just a good teacher, he's just a man. No, not true. Or, like Joe witnesses, Jesus is an archangel, an angel. He's Archangel Michael, actually, that's what the Joe witnesses teach. No, <laughs> he's not an angel, neither an archangel. So this is the kind of stuff that we have, even in the beginning of Christianity, we have that problem of people, oh, this is what Jesus is, this is what Jesus is, you know, and until, you know, Jesus Superstar, the hippie guy, you know, in the 70s. Jesus Superstar, I like that movie, but I was a hippie back then, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> I was a hippie for two days, then I, I, I gave up. All I liked about it was the long hair and the guitar. But <laughs> okay, uh, 1 John 4, I'm going to finish with that one. And verse 9 to uh, 12. If we receive the testimony, of, the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. God testified about his Son. We see that a lot in John, too many ways. The signs are one of the important ways. They are witnesses to him. And, and Nicodemus comes to Jesus in John chapter 3 says, nobody can do the signs that you do unless he's from God. Member of the Sanhedrin, huh? great, great rabbi, Nicodemus. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. So that's, that's also very, very crucial in the book of John. Huh? I, there's things like that. Uh, life is a, is a central theme in the book of John from the beginning all the way to the end. You can see the word life repeated, repeated. Eternal life, life all in every chapter, basically. So I, I, I said all of this as a parenthesis. We're in John chapter 5 to explain the reaction to the words of Jesus in John 5 after he heals the man who is paralyzed for 38 years there in the pool. Then he begins by saying, my father works up till now, up to the present, and I work also. He's showing uh, intimacy, connect, close connection between his father and him. My father works up t until now. Uh, I, I'm not just a, a, a prophet or a teacher born at some point in Bethlehem from Nazareth. I'm not just Jesus of Nazareth. That's what that's saying. He's equating himself with the father. Now, we believe or we don't believe that. But John writes to show that he's demonstrated that. He's proven that beyond a doubt, beyond a shadow of a doubt. God offers a lot of proof in the life of Christ, in what he does, in what he teaches. Our faith does not rest on some kind of vague hope somewhere. Blind hope. Our faith is founded on scripture, things that God really did in history, in time and space. Of course, that's why the unbelievers want to try and deny he never existed. But it's hard to deny that. So that's it. That's all we're going to do today. Nothing in basically in John, but kind of like to show that aspect. Uh, so that <coughs> that'll be <coughs> sorry. That'll be also on the YouTube, except for the coffee part. I'm going to take that out because I have the I can do that. Not, not I can do that in live, but I can do that with the YouTube. That's the funny part. So people look at the live, then they look at the YouTube. It's not the same thing. What happened there? Because I kind of, I kind of, you know, worked on it, you know, a little bit. Because I don't want to show that how I'm a little bit.